All right, this is uh, a series of messages that I put together, and uh, so that's what I've done for this conference. And, and the overall arcing theme is how to glorify God. And so this technically is how to have family devotions to the glory of God. And so yesterday I covered how to buy a car to the glory of God. Our church has heard that. Um, I did how to balance a budget to the glory of God. And so this session, uh, is we're going to start out with Proverbs 22, verse 6, which is probably a verse that you know. I'll go ahead and read it, and then we'll turn prayer. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Father, would you bless us during this hour, that we would glorify your name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. What does it mean to train up a child in the way he should go? And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Perhaps you have heard it mean, well, if I train my kids and I have them in church every single Sunday, then that guarantees me that they will be godly Christians when they grow up. I hear grunting. Because we know that's not the case. So therefore, with that question in mind, is Proverbs 22, 6 verse wrong? Well, it's the Word of God. It can't be wrong. It's just misunderstood. This verse describes how things generally work. Understand that it is a proverb. It is a principle. It is not a guarantee. But number two, there is a second part of this verse where there is a negative connotation. If a parent is inconsistent in his spiritual walk, Understand, you are teaching the child the same thing. Your child is a recipient of your behavior and will emulate, emulate you. So if you walk in wisdom, generally they will follow in your footsteps. Not a guarantee. It's a principle. If you are wicked, what shall they do? The same so in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, God commands fathers to bring children up in nurture and admonition of the Lord. Very literally, training and instruction, warning them that if there's no godliness, there will be repercussions. Training, instruction. Instruction is a concept of words, verbal teaching. Training is an action. The words must meet the action. So, let me <clears throat> illustrate it this way. A few months ago, Judson started a football season. And uh, he was with his coach and did very poorly in a game. He was playing cornerback and was out of position quite often. So after the game, I talked to him and said, well, let's go. To no, I don't want to talk to the coach. It was just a bad game. I said, no, no. You're missing something. So I brought him over to the coach, and I said, Coach, what went wrong? So the coach took him onto the field, and she began drilling with him, saying, I'm doing this. Here's your reaction. This is what I want from you. Drop off the receiver when he hits this point because the safety is over here. Play your position. Stay in your house. Judson took the training from his coach on the field who was hands-on training. He applied it to his game. And I'm not bragging, but this is what the coach did with him. In the next six games, he had six interceptions returned for touchdowns. They called him the pick machine. And, and it wasn't this, this, oh, Judson happened to get lucky. He was trained by his coach. And he did exactly what his coach told him to do. That's training. So parents, Proverbs 22.6 replaces you or places you in a position where you're not just verbally giving instructions. Stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it! Do we do that? Yes. Yes. What does the child hear? Here's what God wants. I know how to do this. I know how to emulate this. Child, let me teach you. Let me train you. Let me walk with you so that your behavior changes. So they're just not hearing whack, 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 whack with your instructions in your mouth. Mm -hmm. Now, 
There's a battle going on. And the battle is for your child's heart and mind. Most Christian parents know that there is a battle going on for the gospel. Our greatest burden is to see our children accept Christ as Savior, right? Yes. But we often fall short by thinking, well, we just get them saved, then we're okay from there. Mm -hmm. No, no, that's not Proverbs 22 6. And if we're all transparent, we have to confess that we as parents fail in training every day. And so one way to help train the heart of the child is what? Family emotions. They're difficult. They're laborious. They expose our failures as parents. Do you think that just because I'm a pastor, we get this easy spiritual blessing over our home and say, ah, oh, this is great. <laughs> Not at all. My family devotions are just as much as a struggle as yours because they are hard work. Pastors are not these super spiritual people who don't struggle with things. Having consistent family devotions is hard work. But I think it is best encapsulated in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Let me read it to you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. How? You shall talk of them when you sit in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be the frontlets in between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now, we are not Old Testament Israel, but I would suggest to you God's plan for the family has not changed. God's plan is to saturate your family with His Word. Not when you just sit, not when you stand, not when you go to bed, not when you get up, not when you walk out the door, not when you return. It's all of it. Super saturation of the Word of God. Family devotions are an effective way to begin that process. They are not the means to an end that if you have your family devotions from now to the time your child's 18, you are producing a godly kid. That's not what I'm saying. But you are now teaching and training principles that your children can know. Um, do they really benefit us? Let me give you a couple different opinions. J.I. Packer wrote, Family worship was to the Puritans vitally important. Daily and indeed twice daily, the Puritans recommended the family as the family together should hear the word of God read and pray to God. Interesting, that's in our country's history as well as across the pond. Charles Spurgeon wrote, If we want to bring up a godly family, who shall be a seed to serve God when our heads are under the clouds of the valley? Let us seek to train them up in the fear of God by meeting together for family worship. It is a declaration that God is the center of this home. Our home does not revolve around the parents. Our home does not revolve around the children. Our home revolves around Jesus Christ alone. If you're not taking the time to put in biblically that your home is centered on the scriptures, it's not going to happen on accident. It won't happen at all. Barna Institute put out a survey of born-again Christians who read their Bibles together as a family. Anybody want to take a guess what percentage born again Christians read their Bibles together as a family? Not really. Not really. Three. 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 Ten. Ten percent. And you wonder why young people are leaving our churches in droves. Now, I'm not saying that having devotion is going to fix all that. But is it part of the solution? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard devotions called the family altar time. You ever hear it called mm -hmm. that? Yep. Um, I think that's probably a wrong terminology for dispensationalism because we don't have altars. <laughs> uh, 
you know, tomorrow morning you're not coming into the front of the church ah! and, and sacrificing at the altar. We don't have altars <laughs> in the church, right? No. Where is the altar today? What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? You are the temple, okay? So the altar is your heart. But, I like this concept because it matches Romans 12.1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That concept is that we are living sacrifices who worship God with our lives and not just Sunday mornings. What better way to worship God than sitting down with your family and cracking open your Bible? That's what he wants. It sets a precedent. It says, Lord, our family revolves around you. We desire to submit to your will today as a family. We will even hold each other accountable to obey the things that we learn today. And so when your child comes up and says, Daddy, you didn't obey family devotions today. Is that a good thing? Yes. If it's done with respect and honor. <laughs> yeah. Yes. 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 Because the child listened to the Word of God. Okay. So let me give you some principles here. And then we'll get into what should I do. About. Principle number one. Simplicity wins. When we open the Word around our children, our intention is not to preach a sermon. It is to lay one brick at a time. Simplicity wins. We don't need to have elaborate discussions every time that we sit down for family devotions. We don't need theologians. It's nice to be a theologian if you study the Word. But most parents go, oh, I don't think I'm able to do this. It's intimidating for me. That's not what we're talking about. Can you open the Bible and read it and allow the Holy Spirit to teach your children? Yes, you can. I'm not looking for sermons. We are looking to lay one foundational truth today. So think about this. Again, football illustration, since that's where I was when I was writing this message <laughs> a month ago. A football team running plays isn't always looking for the big one. They are stringing together a couple of plays three to four yards at a time moving the ball down the field. Every time we open the scripture, we discuss an aspect that just gets us a few yards. J.C. Ryle wrote, we must not expect all things at once. We must remember what children are and teach them that they are able to bear. <coughs> Their minds are like lumps of metal and not to be forged and made useful all at once, but by a succession of spiritual blows their understanding are like narrow-necked vessels. We must pour the wine of knowledge gradually, or much of it will be spilled and lost. So if you get a bottle that has a thin neck on it, and what happens when you try to cram all the liquid into it? You spill. The devotions can be simple. If you don't have a routine, start with five and ten minutes on a regular basis. You can work your way up to more, but you've got to start somewhere. Our children may not remember everything that you teach them in family devotions. <clears throat> but they're going to be fed because you've given them the word of God. Be consistent with how you do it. And we'll talk about that. Children flourish under consistency and routine. Number two, simplicity leads to death. Football team illustration again. So you start running three to four yard plays. Eventually you're going to break one. You will get a longer game. Simplicity will lead to depth. When you open the scriptures and have a discussion about the Word of God, there will be times where the Holy Spirit moves and you have a longer discussion. After sometimes we just have a Bible reading, Ask the Lord's blessing for the day, and we move on. But once in a while, God moves, and we have a bigger lesson. So last week, we struggled with one of our children, I won't use name, who had a very disrespectful moment with her mommy. Oops. That uh, <laughs> we've never had before. Ever. 
never even had it in my mind that this thing would happen. We dealt with that. There was punishment. There was confession. There were tears. There was restoration. There was hug. There was love. It was over. Two days later, we opened the Bible for family devotions, and wouldn't you know it, it was the exact illustration that happened in our house two days ago. Do you know what we did? We laughed. <laughs> The crime was already done. The punishment was already what done. Was it? I'm not telling you what it was. And so we said, oh, child, what did you learn from this? Well, this is what I learned, and I should do this, and I should do that. And God taught me this, and oh, oh, you know, that was a beautiful moment in our family. And it won't happen again with that particular crime, because I think we exterminated it. But... The Lord did that in a couple days and brought that devotion because that's not what I planned. It just happened to be the next part of the material. The Holy Spirit did. Number three, expect inconsistency and failure. Listen, life is busy, demands uh, for work. Sometimes the church doesn't even push family devotions. Our own flesh, we will fail. What happens if you fail in family devotions? Start again. This is a long-term calling. Dads, take the lead in your home and open the Word of God. If you miss a day, start again. If you miss a week, start again. If you miss a month, start again. There's nothing wrong with coming to your children and saying, I've not been leading our family in the way that I should. We're getting back in the saddle today, and we're doing what is right. You know, your children will actually appreciate that humility more than you just bumbling through, because it's sincerity. You will fail, and when you fail, start again. Number four, <clears throat> Dad, you need to open God's Word. Kids need to see a father leading a home the way that God intended. The material is important, but it's not the most important. The material will change with the age of the children. The significance, though, of the leader of the family will never change. The Bible repeatedly commands the father to raise up the children in the way they should go. The command rarely, if at all, is ever given to the wife or the mother. Yet, who is raising children in America? Mothers. No one can substitute the responsibility that God gives to dad in the family. No one can. Nothing is effective as dad opening up his Bible as the leader appointed by God in his home. Mom, when dad isn't available, you lead the children. Don't undermine his authority. But you step up and you teach the children. And that's going to happen with busyness of life, with work and such. And maybe dad doesn't feel comfortable with his permission and with respect. Leave your children to do it. Number five, use verbal Bible reading. So in 1 Timothy 4.13, Paul gives a list of three commands. He wants sound doctrine. He wants exhortation, but he also says to reading. And I'm, my assumption here is it's reading the Word of God. So, giving sound doctrine is a public ministry. Exhortation is a public ministry. So, with the context, I'm going to assume that this reading Paul tells Pastor Timothy to do is also a public ministry of reading the Word. When we hear, we can process differently. Furthermore, verbalizing the scriptures cements it into the mind in a different way. Let one of the parents, mom or dad, read the word of God aloud to the children. Dad, you start first. I think probably the greatest revival in scripture is when Ezra stood up and Israel had just come out of Babylon, and they're reassembling into their homeland. They made him a makeshift pulpit, and he got up, 
And he never preached a sermon. You know what Ezra did? He opened God's word and he read the law to the people. The result of it, they were weeping under conviction and got right with God. From reading the word of God. Can God do that today? Yes. And I will say this. That I love listening to the Bible verbally. So if I go walk, sometimes I'll turn on and listen to audio Bible. In fact, a sermon series in our church was just born out of that very practice. Help, I have a dysfunctional family. Because I was listening to the book of Genesis and went, man, these people are seriously messed up. And I heard it in a way, I've read it a billion times, but I heard it in a way where it was actually dramatized and all the characters were talking to each other. And I went, whoa. I learned. Read the Word of God aloud. Number six. Get a regular routine. So, part of the genius of Deuteronomy 6-7 is that we're told to talk about the Scriptures sitting in the way. When do families sit down most likely? Mealtime. Listen, I'm gonna, I'll just get on a, a little bit of tangent here, okay? If you don't eat together as a family, you are losing out on great fellowship. Now, I know that jobs and, and such are so that Jay's away, you may be on the road, David doesn't get home in time, things like that. I mean, I get it. I get it. But your goal as a family, that there should be an appointed time, if everybody is available, to sit down and eat together as a family. It is a wonderful time and a wonderful tool. Make sure you clear off the table if it's full of junk. And you sit down and you have a fellowship meal with your family. And this is where my father taught me that children are made to be seen and not heard. But that's a different story. <laughs> that's how I was brought up. Too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so families sit together at a regular meal. What we do in our home is we sit together every morning and we have breakfast together before the kids go do their school. And we have our family devotions in the morning. That may not work for you because your, your schedule is different. <clears throat> it could be your dinner meal. But what I find is time devotions to a meal helps you get into routine because you have to eat. Okay? So if you have to eat, why don't you eat two ways? Physically and spiritually. Put it together. Start eating towards the end of the meal. Break out your Bible and have your devotions. One thing about that is because mouths are full, it's quieter. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Just saying. <laughs> but get to a routine. And I always suggest around one of the meals. Ours is breakfast time. Uh, we're, we're like clockwork. It's from 8 to 8.30. And 8.30, we're done, gone. Kids are out doing school and, and we're set. Number seven. Variety is the spice of life. Now, there's no right way and wrong way to open the Bible and read, right? Scriptures have to be the focus. The right way to do family devotions is the way that's also not exasperating to your children. Don't exasperate them. Every method gets boring and stale after a while. Wise parents mix it up. And I'll give you some ideas coming up in a moment. Don't Miss the opportunity to teach the heart. Don't preach at your children. Train them with love. And do it with variety. Steer clear of resources that don't bring you to the Bible. You need to see your kids receive God's written truth because it's the foundation of their lives. So there are resources that can be great, but they always have to come back to Scripture. Okay? And I'll talk about that in a moment. Give little hands some work to do, right? Little hands need activity. 
not all of the children might be able to read. They can listen. But supply coloring pages that match the theme of the devotionals that you're using. They can get it in sight and in sound. So be creative. Come up with questions that all children can understand. And I'll show you how to do that here. Number nine, solve the Bible dilemma. You can open the Bible in different ways. Dad brings the Bible and others listen. Mom brings the Bible and others listen. Number two, everyone brings to the Bible and they follow along. Or the children read the Bible and lead in the scripture reading. We've done all three of those things. All of them are very effective. Whatever the case, develop a routine on what you do with your Bible. It is never wrong to sit down and have your child open the Bible. That way you can find the book of Hezekiah very quickly. <laughs> all right. General principles. Why, what, where are we going with this? Now that we got those, how do we do it? What should I do? And I think this is probably the question that most people come to. What should I do in order to get devotions running in the family? And then I've got probably about 15 minutes, and then I'll open it for questions if you have them. Number one. Now get this. I know this is deep. Ready? Read the Bible together. Oh, <gasps> you mean family devotions are as easy as opening the Bible? Yes, that's actually what I'm. The pastor, I don't have the curriculum. I don't know what to teach. I don't know. Read the Word of God. Did you get it? Yeah, but we didn't understand it. Well, that's the Holy Spirit's job. You read it. Here's the thought. Some people love to read through the Bible in a year as their annual practice. Anybody do that? It's a good thing. You should try. I've never heard of a family reading through the Bible in a year. It's three chapters a day, by the way. I've never heard of that. That's challenging, isn't it? Wouldn't it be amazing that with some of your different ages here, in the next ten years, your family read through the Bible ten times? Well, majority of Christians have never read through it once. Wouldn't that be interesting? Even if you don't read the whole Bible, you can still make goals by reading books of the Bible together in segments. So, select a book. Well, I don't know much about this book, but I want to read it. And we want to learn what it is. Well, get a good study Bible, like a Ryrie study Bible. That's my favorite. Read the introduction so you know what the book is about. Before you do the devotions, moms and dads, read through the study notes that are there so you understand the concepts of what's going on. And then teach your children one book at a time as you read maybe a chapter. Sometimes you're not going to read a chapter. You come to Psalm 119? No, you're not reading hundreds of verses of the kids. Okay. That exasperates them. But you can take a psalm and break it up into ten sections. Or, uh, I don't remember off the top of my head, section Psalm 19, 119. When you read the Bible, ask three questions of the children. And these can be answered during the Bible reading or after. Number one, what did we learn about God? So inside this portion of Scripture, what did we learn about God? Number two, what did we learn about man? What did we learn about man? And then number three, what does God want man to do? What does God want man to do? That's simple. Um, variety is the spice of life, right? Technology can play a wonderful part 
in daily Bible reading. Don't always use it. The preference is for the Father to be reading the Scriptures. But I have this dramatized Bible app, and every time I break it out, the kids go nuts. Sometimes we'll get in the car, Dad, can you put that thing on? And he made the middle bar to pass through the boards from one end to the other. This is Solomon building the temple. He overlaid the boards with gold, made their rings of gold to be holders for the bars, mm -hmm. what and overlaid the bars with gold. Word of Promise Complete the Audio Bible, New King James Version. thread and fine woven linen. We've got the it was worked with an artistic yeah. design of cherubim. Um, the fascinating thing is that they change characters. So if there's somebody talking, it switches to a different person, and you now get a dramatized version. Um, so, by the way, uh, if you want to read through the whole Bible or listen to it, this is 89 hours and 37 minutes. What I do is I actually speed it up to one and a half times so that I can get through it in only 70 hours. <laughs> Um, Word of Promise, Complete Audio Bible, New King James. I don't know how much that is, Josh. Do you have that? Mine's in Audible. So it's in Audible? Yeah. Oh, it's in Audible? That's, uh, but it's, it has other places, too. I, just, I found an app, too, but I don't know if this is the right one. I'll find out. It's got a whole bunch of actors on the front of it. Nope. Or faces, yeah. Well, actually, it's the same name, but it's just not those. Okay, it might be a, a different name. I might need to type it in. Right, we'll figure that out. So, let me see the efforts. Yeah, um, definitely. Again, it's variety. Um, it's not always demanding that thou shall sit down and I shall read the Bible, right? But at the same time, you still want to verbally teach your children and don't always rely on it. Um, Number two, memorize a passage. Memorize a passage. Okay, a few of you have heard this before. Our church memorizes one chapter of Scripture every single year together. Year one, we memorized Romans 12 when we started this. We've gone to 1 Corinthians 13. We've gone to James 1, and we're working on Psalm 19. How many of you pull out that memory verse and read it at one meal a day. Well, that's the way you memorize scripture. So yes, you can get it down fairly well by the end of 52 weeks by attending our church because you hear it in 52 different services. Great. But, do you understand that we do this so that you can also memorize it at home? How long does it take to read through Psalm 19? A few minutes. But if you're doing it, what you're going to notice is that your children start picking up. If that's too much, it's too long, we'll start with just little segments. Take the first paragraph and for a month, work on the first five verses. And then go to the next part. And then go to the next part. Um, even if the children can't read well, can't read good, they can still listen to what's going on. I've noticed this with my own children when going into preschool, going into kindergarten. We use a Becca. And what do they do? They stand and they recite over and over and over and over. You can't help but memorize it. And they're not always reading it. They hear it. And they develop the cadence. So, read aloud together. Children are excellent at quoting scripture. Give them the opportunity. Take a chapter and bring it to your devotions and start your devotions by reading that memory section. It doesn't have to be the full chapter. Break it down. Here's a method. Read a chapter a day. So, for example, um, in my personal devotions, one of the things that I like to do is I like to use the three W's. Number one, I work on my worship. So I'll start with a chapter in Psalms. And then I will go to Proverbs because I want to work on my wisdom. And then I want to work on my walk by going to a New Testament epistle. Okay? Reading one of the Psalms a day is a great way to start knowing the identity of God. Because that's exactly what they teach. 
So as we're reading, you can say, okay, children, I'm going to read Psalm whatever today. And as I read, I want you to write down the attributes of God that tells us things about Him. He's wise. He's caring. He's loving. He's this. He's that. He hates sin. He loves this. Okay? And then discuss what they found while you were reading the Bible to them. What about Proverbs? How many chapters in Proverbs? 31. How many months in a year have 31 days? Seven. One proverb a day. Kind of neat. It matches. Read a proverb and say, what is God teaching us today about wise living? And as you read, come to those children and have them listen for what God wants them to do today in wisdom. Write those answers down and talk about them. As your kids get older, you can do issues of the day. Um, discussions about things that your family needs. And this is not a time to single out children and pick on them. But it is a time when a father can say, I think we need to brush up on some areas here that we're weak on. So I am planning out a series of issues um, that are 10 minutes in discussion long, and we'll see where God leads us to go ahead and to get our family into the Scripture. So... Let's do this. Your children struggle with some issues. How about this? Kindness. So dad, mom, you prepare five verses on kindness. And then you come to the children and say, okay children, you've really not been kind to each other. So, for the next few minutes, I want us together in, as a family to look at verses on kindness. What can you find? Teach your child how to open a Bible and go to a concordance on kind and kindness. Have your children now go through the Bible. Okay? Sally, Bob, John, Leroy, Eloise. Good name. Switch and go through the reading with those children and say, what is that about kindness? And that way, you are sourcing the problem of the family in the Word of God. So that in that day, you can bring them back and say, what did the Bible say? What did we learn in the Scriptures about this topic today? A great benefit is that we are directing our children to the Bible for the answers. That's the key. Number five, a Christian testimony. Parents, make this an annual, at least, habit. Share with your children how you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Do you know your parents' testimony if they were saved? Why not? A few weeks ago, our church lost our oldest member. He passed away at 103 months. His testimony of salvation is that he was converted to Christ fighting in World War II. It's a cool story. I don't have time to tell it to you. As I was at his bedside, I was talking with his daughter, and I said, well, I know this man's saved, and I shared with her his <coughs> salvation testimony. Come to find out, she had never heard before. You should have seen the smile on her face. And she went, wow, Pops, that's incredible. Within minutes, he was actually with the Lord. But the joy that this daughter had, because she said, I know I will see him again. I've heard his story. It's a beautiful thing. It's a precious gift to your child. I know my parents' salvation testimonies. One, because I led my dad to the Lord and he's now home with the Lord. But number two, my mom has shared hers often with our family. They are invaluable tools. If you have a Christian guest staying in your home, ask them to share their salvation testimony with your family. There's nothing more valuable than hearing the story of God's redemption in the life of a sinner. Make sure you tell it often. Sword drills. Be careful on sword drills. Don't let it become rambunctious time. 
Don't use them often <laughs> because they can get pretty rowdy. Personal devotions. It's very important that your family knows that mom and dad are studying the Bible themselves, right? What's the point of having family devotions if you're not having your personal devotions? That's a disconnect. That's a problem. So, dads, come to your family and say, this is what God taught me yesterday. And this is what I want to teach you today. Moms, do the same thing. One of my fondest memories of my mother is getting up every single morning and she was always sitting at the kitchen table. Her tattered Bible was sitting there and she had this old devotional that didn't even have a binding on it anymore. It was kept together by rubber bands because she had used it for so many years. We finally got her a new one and she still uses it every single day. But I can still see my mother sitting at the table studying her Bible. <clears throat> And she would share with us the things that she learned. We never had family devotions. Dad was not in a position spiritually to do that. Mom never really led us in family devotions that way. But I still have that memory of my mother making it practical and teaching to us what she learned. You do the same thing. You can read a book together and um, be careful that the Bible is your source. Don't ever just like read a biography and not include scripture, okay? The Bible is the source. But I have found that reading missionary biographies is an incredible benefit to the family. A chapter, half chapter. Our children hang on every word. Every word. So reading a good Christian biography of Amy Carmichael, Adoniram Judson, Jim Elliot, they are really great ways. Make sure the Bible is included, though. Other resources? All right, let me see if I can pull this up. Oh, I'm not in here. Right. Okay. Oh, I'm parking it. There we go. This is our church website. Excuse the resources. Scroll, oh, sorry. Devotions. There are four devotionals on our church website. My Atmos for His Highest, Morning and Evening, Charles Spurgeon, Our Daily Bread. This is the one my family uses. Every night at midnight, this updates and gives you a new devotional. You can listen to it, or I will read it to our family, and then we have questions and response discussions at the end. We've been using this for a few years. I absolutely love it. It is on a level that even as a pastor, I go, wow, that is great theology, and I am learning. So when people come and say, well, I, you know, I don't read well, I struggle with, with reading the Bible, I say, start with Kids for Truth. I'm not trying to insult you, but this is what I do. I'm not ashamed of it. I love this devotional, and it updates automatically so that by the next day that you come, it is in place and work. Um, I just absolutely adore it, and uh, I can't recommend a, a better resource for child family devotions. Alright. Ah. Um, two things I want to leave you with. Number one, the whole point of family devotions is to apply the message of the Bible to the family's life. It's not to do a check mark. It's not to appease your conscience. It is to let the Bible teach you. Psalm 119.11, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. That's the goal. That's not memorization. That's thy word have I hid in my heart. Parents, remind your children throughout the day that this devotion is applicable. So, uh, what was that? Thursday. 
we had a devotional on mercy. So I taught. Reagan, what is mercy? I don't know. Judson, what's mercy? Oh, holding back what we deserve. Judson, what is the best illustration? Hoover Dam. The Hoover Dam holds back a massive lake of water. That is the picture of God's wrath. And he's holding it back so we don't get blasted by it. So, throughout the day, brother and sister. <laughs> right? Is that what happens in your home? <laughs> I can't believe you did that. Hey, Judson, is that merciful? No. <laughs> Reagan, what's going on in there? Judson threw my flip flop in the trash, <laughs> and I'm gonna do this. Well, this is I'm gonna, this is true, Lord. Life, so. <laughs> and I said, No, you're not gonna do that. Is that merciful? No. <laughs> what does God want us to do? I think on Thursday, there were probably five times I brought up our family devotional and said, is that what God wants us to do today? Does that happen every day? No. But the whole point is application to the heart. Number two, family devotions help us to learn how to pray together. As growing up, my mom had her own personal prayer times. We didn't pray much together as a family, but over the kitchen sink, she had the praying hands on a plaque, and the plaque said, the family that prays together stays together. That is always stuck in my mind. Prayer during devotions don't have to be long. They just have to be strong. What do I pray for? Well, this is where your missionary cards are. Where's your missionary cards in your church? This is where your missionary letters come in. When I get missionary letters, I bring them into church. I leave them up by the pulpit or on the back table. Where was it? Um, this is where your church prayer sheet from Wednesday nights or Thursday nights comes in. You don't have to tackle the whole thing. This is where you go into your church directory and going down family by family, praying specifically for one family a day. For some churches like ours, that's not even going to take long. You get through it in a few weeks. And then you send a text message say, hey, our family prayed for you in our devotions today. Do you have any requests that we continue to pray for? That never happens, folks. Ah, the pastor, the deacon, they'll pray enough. No. You pray for your church family. You find out how bad it is. So I'm going to end on Ephesians 6, 4. And fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training training. You emulate it for them. And the admonition, warn them of bad conduct or consequence if they don't honor the Lord. Alright. i got two minutes. Questions? Yes? Um, well, I wanted to ask a couple of things. Um, you made mention of Psalms and Proverbs. Sure. And like the New Testament as a whole. Like we're trying to, it's kind of poignant in our lives right now. We're starting to think, my son's just turned two. We're starting yeah. to think about like, how do we start Facilitating that, how we bring that into the day, boy time in the morning, that kind of thing. Um, are there particular parts of the Bible you could lavish a little more care on in, than other parts of the Bible? And, and which ones? Yeah. So, um, obviously, it's going to be difficult to read uh, Psalms to your child that are precatory prayers, uh, bringing damnation down on people. <laughs> um, there's no wrong answer when you're reading the Word of God. Um, some of the Old Testament books. Leviticus might be a bad book for you to start on. Genesis is not a bad book for you to start on because it teaches life values. Um, what's your favorite books? Oh man, any of the Gospels, Hebrews is great, most first John. There's your answers. Genesis, Psalms. Uh-huh. Alright, so you just mapped out about 10 years worth of reading. Now, Jessica. When Daddy can't be home because he's on the road, FaceTime him, call him, and ask him to read, if he's willing, to read the scriptures to his daughter and his wife. We have technology. Use it. And wouldn't it be precious if a child can grow up and say, well, Daddy wasn't in the home because he had to work a lot, but you know, he always called it in and we read our Bible together. We don't think that way. Think outside the box, okay? All right, we're done. Thank you. Lord bless you.